Stories of the Week is brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Pony Express, check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean, pen-testing machine. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today so we can ask you if you're ready for a penetration (laughs) test. That's right. Today is the last day to purchase an encryption is not a crime t-shirt and support the EFF and or Hackers for Charity and get $10 off a Hack Naked t-shirt for the invoice um, from your uh, purchase of the shirt or uh, your support of the EFF to Chris at securityweekly.com. That's Chris with a K, K R I S at securityweekly.com. And he'll send you a $10 off coupon valid for any hack naked shirt in our online store at shop.securityweekly.com. I have the EFF hoodie. It's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> Love it. Especially this time of year. Okay. Uh, where do we want to begin? Do we want to begin with the big news of the week? It really isn't such the big news of the week. I don't know. What do you guys think about the, the ghost vulnerability? Yeah, the that's, ghost. that's, that's, it's scary. Uh, I think, I think it is, I think it is big news. I mean, remember we talked about Paul, um, beginning with, um, with Heartbleed, how the exploitation, uh, research community was starting to reach into, um, more of the infrastructure code, more of the dynamic libraries um, that are, are part of our ongoing existence. And I think Ghost is um, is an example of this. It's in glibc. Um, it's real. Uh, and it has got a um, multiplicative effect because it's in an infrastructure library. Um, and I think it's going to be an interesting journey we're going to go through this year because of that. Um, now, it, you know, it's a relatively simple buffer overflow right now, but... Um, you know, other things will will come out of of this kind of research, and I think we're going to see more and more of it. Now, I was reading something, Carlos. Maybe you can verify this. That, um, and I remember this when it was doing programming, that you shouldn't use that the function get host by name. There's bad coding practice to do that. Is that true? Do you know, Carlos? Carlos, Earth to Carlos. I read that in, in or I saw a headline in that in the why why can't I get this uh Eratisec blog from uh Robert Graham? I saw that on here. Well I I'll, I'll respond to you, Paul. I have not read that, so um I, I probably am guilty of using get host by name in a few different things, but um I, I'd be interested to know what Carlos thinks. Uh this is the first I've heard about it. Typically when we program, we're taught not to use IPs and always to use fully qualified domain names because that way you can actually change your infrastructure in the background and don't have to kind of dig into code for um, IP addresses, hard-coded IP addresses. So Exactly. Yeah. Robert's saying that most modern software uses get a DDR info function call instead of get host by name because get host uh-huh. by name is prone to exploits. That's what he says. Uh, I, I, I haven't coded in Linux, so no clue yeah, there. Yeah, I've coded in C in a while, right? Well, I mean, the, the, the thing is that, that a tremendous amount of the operating system uh, is going to be using get host by name. I mean, this, this goes back years and years. Hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> get host by name is going to be, it's a very old function call. You know, it's 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 been around. Uh, now he also says that most things aren't vulnerable because the bug only allows you to override a few bytes. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So that's that is in fact true, and many exploits are local only. Yep. Correct. Also. Gotcha. Yeah. The, the, I, the, I, what I, you have to think about it is whatever you're exploiting, it has to take a fully qualified domain name mm-hmm. and try to resolve that back to you, the attacker. So, mm-hmm. possible targets, uh, anything that will do a pingback, let's say a blogging system, a CMS system that has some comments and is trying to do a pingback to check 
who's posting this or reposting it, uh, email systems that use spam filtering that want to check the domain at the other side will probably use that. Probably some type of authentication system that may validate via email and wants to kind of do a, a reverse lookup of who is actually connecting to them and then validating that domain. Something of that nature, uh, which is not too common out there. There are going to be some examples. They say that XM is vulnerable, but from what I've been seeing, I haven't been able to actually confirm it is, even though I followed uh, the write up to the letter. Uh, the other one is, let's say, WordPress pingbacks, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, could also be vulnerable to this. Uh, other than that, everything else I have been seeing has been locally exploited. Gotcha. Yeah, Exim seems to be the popular target for this one. Now, they say it is printable. Nobody has been able to prove it. They have a write-up, and everybody I've talked to, they says we'll look at it. We've tried their put, uh, uh, proof of concept code, and it hasn't worked. We have modified it. doesn't work. And everybody's kind of waiting for Qualys to actually put out that Metasploit module that they promised. Well, I think some of this is about accessibility to um, be able to pass the data to the function. Um, and, and then that's really the challenge here, right? Uh, and, you know, get host by name uh, is going to be wrapped around, um, you know, in, well, encapsulated by some sort of application layer software, right? A XM in this case, whatever, whatever client is passing some sort of domain name into the function, you have to be able to manipulate the data going into that, that piece of software. In, in order to try to exploit it. So that's going to have a tremendous amount of variability. Um, can, I ask a, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. All right. So uh, I tend to look at stuff now from more of a leadership perspective. All right. I saw the headline. I'm going to come to you guys. Guys, I saw this thing. And let's be fair, right? I'm going to call it Glib C. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I see this thing called Glib, Glib something. Uh, how big a deal is it? And, and in terms of like we already talked about prioritizing assets and efforts, somebody sees this and they've already got 50 hours of work they're getting paid for 35 they've got a soccer game on Thursday night and a birthday party this weekend is this top on their list middle on their list is this something we wait on for a little bit and see how it unfolds what's the priority of this well I would say it would, it, it, in my opinion it would be middle of the list because since it, it is a library and it's a component that is not statically compiled into most applications unless the person actually wanted it to statically compile it, it could be easily patched in your infrastructure. Where it becomes a high priority would be on embedded systems. How many Linux okay. embedded systems you have in your environment and because you're not going to be able to patch those. And that is where having proper knowledge of your environment actually comes to play. If you don't have uh, many embedded systems running Linux exposed to the web with things that actually resolve back, not not much of a worry. Linux systems, typically what you do is you apply the patch, it substitutes the library, you restart the services, you're okay, you just set up a time window to apply all those patches and just reboot those services. And you should be okay. Something that could be taken care of. Do you have to reboot those services, Carlos? Yes. Do you have to reboot the system? Or maybe You both? have to reboot the services. Just the services. Just the services because the, the, the dynamic library, uh, the dynamic object has to come back into memory when the service restarts. Yep. Um, but the um, – Carlos is right. The, the embedded systems that are either statically compiled or don't have a patch mechanism that is automated – are going to be a much bigger challenge because, you know, th then you've got, and then you're dealing with, um, you know, a real human time to actually reach out and patch them. So knowing your environment and prioritizing how vulnerable those assets are is going to be the critical uh, point there. Yeah, for example, if I have Iron Port, I'm going to be on the vendor like, hey, dude, I know you run Linux. I know you run a bunch of open source tools here. I know this is for spam, so it's actually doing reverse DNS queries back to the web trying to check on people. Um, do I need to worry? Should I patch this? Why aren't you getting me a patch? But if yep. you're not running any of those services and everything's running, let's say, on the cloud and you're 
um, let's say Office 365 and all of your spam filtering has ta been taken care of over there and you're running IIS on your servers that are exposed to the web, then uh, I don't have to worry. Oh, but no, 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 I'm running XDEM and I'm running web uh, WordPress and like, hmm, okay, dude, now it went from middle to, to high in your environment because your environment's different. Your environment could be a possible target. So mm -hmm. knowledge of your environment will determine if it is medium or high uh, for you in that case. I, I would I would say that uh, your Linux administrators responsible for systems, especially if they're running things like email servers that are exposed to the internet, probably need to drop almost everything <laughs> and fix those systems. You know, other than that, like Carlos said, I would agree it's a medium medium level priority. Roll out your right patches. Uh, maybe bump up the high, the priority of rolling out your patches to the rest of your Linux environment, uh, and then find everything else that's vulnerable and fix them inside your normal process for that. Finding stuff is that's that's always the <laughs> fun part. <right? laughs> yeah, many yeah, times you know, when, I, when I tell people scan your environment at least twice a week, they go like, "What? Right. Are you kidding?" And they're like, "No, no scan no. it twice a week. <laughs> Do differentials. No." the heck is in your environment? Uh, you just hit the key word there, uh, Carlos, and that is do differentials. A snapshot is not good enough. What is different this week from last week? You know, the other thing I was about to say is I, I appreciate Michael um, asking that question because it actually puts some structure to this conversation that we don't normally have. We tend to uh, wax lyrical about the uh, the joys and fun of the actual vulnerability, but but actually Michael put some, some priority to that, so I uh, appreciate mm -hmm. that. I just and, and thank you for that. You know, it's it's um what I always look at is uh if we if everything is a priority then nothing is a priority. And and I, and what I love with the, the absolute depth of knowledge and experience you guys have is um it's a real opportunity to help somebody say, "All right, so the boss comes, they saw this thing, instead of going, "Oh yeah, no, it's a problem. I'm going to get on it. Thanks, boss. Sorry, hopefully there won't be a gap." It, you you just gave people if they if they listen to this so they replay it. You give them the, You just gave them to say, look, it's probably a middle priority. I've already talked to so and so and the Linux administrators. I've paid attention to these things. I've checked this. I've reached out to these vendors. It's on my watch list, but it's not my highest priority, boss. Because this, this, and this are. Yeah. So, so you know what my highest priority is this week is getting uh, paid. Nineteen Java security holes and a Flash zero day. Yeah. I would say is a way much higher priority than this bug. Oh yeah, especially uh, Java one and the, the the Flash one's already being exploited out there in the yeah, wild. Yeah, there's not so. much you can do. There's no patch because it's a zero day for Flash, which that's probably my highest priority and what's keeping me up at night. Yeah, th there's where I would be going to my proxy and setting up rules at anything that is Flash content, block it. Either way, they shouldn't be w watching porn or YouTube during work hours. Or don't watch it on X Hamster because they were distributing malware for a really long time to like millions of you people. A lot of people watch porn on the internet, apparently. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's like a thing, I guess. Uh, where's my story? I, I wouldn't know anything about that. I don't porn. know what you. Yeah, top smut site flashes visitors. You gotta love the register. Right? <laughs> so they say the attack served the. Bidep Trojan to the site's 500 million viewers a month. 500 oh. viewers a month! <laughs> yeah, on the landing page, they put uh, uh, um, an iframe on the landing page. Um, it did not take advantage of the Angular exploit kick, we're one of the latest. So it didn't take advantage of the latest Flash Zero Day. Of course, they could update that very easily. Yeah. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I thought that was. It goes back to Carlos's recommendation, right? Block block flash. I mean, I hate to say block things, but this week you might want to consider it for a little while. Well, so it does beg the question why, and I'm asking this kind of rhetorically because I, I know the, the answer, but, but you know, sort of taking Michael's path again on this one, uh, maybe a little bit tangentially, the exposure is so much more here because, in my opinion, it's right there in the hands of your users. It's in the hands of inexperienced folks. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about an infrastructure vulnerability that's in that's 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 underneath the hands of, of some quite experienced folks to patch. Right. We're talking about something that's in the hands of the the people on the front lines that are regular yep. business users that just don't know any better and are going to get hurt by it very and, quickly. And, and also it's the nature of the beast in, when it comes to users. When it, it is your servers, it is an active that you have in your data center or in a colo which you control. You have access to it 24-7. You can turn it on, turn it off. 
When it comes to users, their machines may be in the network one moment, they can be outside the network at the other. Yeah, so right. during your patch cycle, they might have you might have missed them. Mm -hmm. They were out in client visits, they're connecting from Starbucks and starting surfing websites. They got pwned and now you have a machine coming back into your environment that you were not able to patch in time that is compromised, that may compromise the rest of your environment. Um, Which goes right back to the need for detection. Because Correct. let's yeah, be does. let's be careful, and I'm not suggesting you guys are saying this, but let's be. So those people are doing their legitimate work. I mean, maybe not the porn surfing at the Starbucks, but <laughs> they're doing their legitimate work, and 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 th they did something that maybe they shouldn't have, or or there was a zero day. They're infected. They come back. They plug back in to you know do their work. It doesn't make them the villain. It means that they were a fantastic attack exploit or they picked up something that brought it back. And, and so just all I'm saying mindset wise is to say, cool, we know that's going to happen. That happens. So I can't prevent that uh, all the time. How quickly can I detect it? And then think about the compassionateness of your response, because they're either going to think that security people are assholes or they're going to go, hey, those guys are pretty freaking cool. They got me back on my feet. I didn't waste a lot of time. They were really nice about it. It's just things that I think about. Carl, so there are endpoint protection vendors or software or configuration that can help that scenario, either with a patched or zero day vulnerability on a third party client application, which still to this day, according to you find folks, uh, and according to my unsophisticated research, is still a huge problem in this industry. Yeah, um, right now there's no silver bullet out no, there that can course. actually address this. Yeah. Uh, I would say in the case of Windows, it would be Emmet. Yeah, I was going to say Emmet. Uh, right. It's free, comes from Microsoft. Um, do test it, it breaks some stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you actually do your due diligence and actually test a couple of st things, it will actually protect you quite well. The other thing is deploy stuff that you can actually manage centrally. Don't don't deploy Firefox, for God's sake. Firefox is such a pain to manage from a central point of view uh, in your environment. Uh, Chrome's a lot easier. Interesting. Um, okay. So uh, don't don't deploy. You know, don't use Internet Explorer, but use Chrome. Uh, and yeah, that, that, if you're going to distribute a browser, right? Distribute a yeah. Chrome. Yeah, if well, you're it's a matter in of the that. case of Microsoft, if you're going to distribute something to your users. Let it be something that you can actually control mm -hmm. and you have some configuration management on it. For example, IE, through Google Policies, I can configure the heck out of it. Mm -hmm. For Chrome, I can do the same. Google actually provides you ADM and ADMX files, so you can import them to your Active Directory environment. Actually, from Active Directory, you can create group policies that will block Java, block extensions. You will enable this. You will block this and limit this other stuff. You can actually control all of the configuration settings. Nice. In the case of Firefox, you have to do logging scripts for the machine or logging scripts for the user that will actually modify that XML file. And you have to control permissions and folders and files so they won't install extensions. And once they install an extension, it's kind of a pain in the ass just to block it from a central kind of management point of, uh, in, in a centralized way. Uh, when we're talking about automation later on, uh, this is one of the stuff you want to automate well, keeping your stuff properly configured because many times a lot of the mistakes and holes that get open in environment is when you're doing firefighting. When there's a problem and you're yeah. going here and you're disabling settings and you're changing this and the, oh, now it worked. Uh, yeah, dude, but you gave permission to everyone. And having a proper configuration uh, configuration management system that either be it be a PowerShell bash script with SSH or whatever, but that will go a puppet chef that will actually go in and make sure that you have a certain set of settings, a base standard that will always be there and will protect you from those uh, snafus of you changing settings. That goes a long way of mitigating kind of the low hanging fruit. Everyone should have their own personal puppet chef. I, I, I think that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one of the challenges with what Carlos was saying is there tends there's a tendency in a lot of environments, and we, we, we sort of touch upon this on the 400th show too, where um, something is done um, in, in, in the heat of the moment to, to sort of help the business along that opens up a huge uh, vulnerability, and it's never rolled back. And then 
even worse, it's never rolled back because it becomes accepted as the proper normal operation of the environment, and politically it's hard to roll back. Um, and so um, that that's a real that's where change management, configuration management stuff is really critically important. Uh, Carlos, you weren't in Washington, D.C. recently, were you? <laughs> no, that was not one of my drones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. Are you referring to the drone that crashed on the White House lawn? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they published pictures of it. Did you yeah, see th th those fucking phantom owners. <laughs> <laughs> they Dude, give it a bad all, rap to all, the drone all people. The bad rap we have are the, all those newbies with phantoms that go, hey, Look at this! I can record my neighbor in the pool. Hey, look at this! I can fly it this way. I'm not gonna do any calibration. Ah, oh, yeah. Instruction says I have to wait for the green light to flash because it means that it got a GPS locked. I don't care. Let's bring it up. I'm not gonna use the GPS. Oh, I'm running out of battery. Oh, the Phantom will go and return to home, and it will go where it got its last uh, position locked. But since you didn't wait it, the GPS said that you were a mile away and now it flew away from you yeah it's it's not rtfm not reading the fuck manual so you think it was an accident or do you think yeah. it was a yeah, the, terrorist the guy attack. actually came out and said oh no i was drinking i was a french body yeah, and i decided to fly my friends phantom and, and the guy actually went, uh, worked for the ngo the uh, national space I, I don't know if it was one of those intelligence agencies that uh, send spy satellites up in, in, into space. That's and, funny. Uh, the best stories start with, I was drunk, and this drone <laughs> crashed on the White House lawn. It was awesome. <laughs> this yeah. one yeah. time, out in front of the White House, yeah. was drinking a little bit. The, the, and then again, the Secret if, Service if, came. It was great. No, if, was if, if I wanted to be my service best guy. Friend. They I, all I, took I, a I, turn I, flying it. They loved it. Yeah. It was so easy. <laughs> Check out my <laughs> selfie. Yeah. But I have to be honest, even though I like the hobby, I also come from a tactical background and just thinking, okay, my drone can actually carry 400 grams. What would 400, 400 grams of C4 or PNTN would actually no. achieve as a target? You were thinking, hmm. how much battery life would I need between <laughs> Colombia and Puerto Rico? <laughs> I was going to say, you hear grams, yeah, you don't tend to think C4. Yeah. Now, the, yeah. the advantage Thanks. of plastic uh, explosives, I just can put the ball bearings right into it, and it's more malleable. All right. Thanks for putting that in perspective for us, Kyle. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> but, the, but, but then again, we're back to security theater. Just think, same thing, I can do it with a toy car and just throw it up the, uh, over the fence at the White House and just drive it over to the building. Um, th there's a lot of stuff. Uh, if, if we start going just to, to all of those angles, just like when you're working security and you're going like, okay, guys, let's do an assessment of risk. Um, it all depends from where you are. I remember having visits in Colombia back in the 90s, and late 90s, and going to a data center and looking out the window and seeing some straight, strange match in the window, and I was asking the guy in the data center, what is that for? And this is anti-grenade match. And go like, oh, Cool. Oh, Do I, I got to add that to my risk matrix. You know so. what I like about this? Um, you're saying the things that some of us admit to thinking but don't always verbalize. And a couple times we do, the people around us are like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> and yet I feel totally natural listening to you going, I mean, I wanted to be snarky and be like, well, at least you haven't put any thought into it. But then I'd be lying because all of us have thought about those exact same things. Yeah. So this is yeah. very comforting. That, that's one thing about being around the information security community will do to you. It'll make you comfortable with those conversations really quickly. <laughs> so do we, yeah, we have we a, start think of all the possibilities, all of the different angles. Exactly. Well, and I always like to ask, what, you know, what are your three ways out of here? If one of these things that I just concocted happens, what do you do? Where do you go? Yep. So we have a picture of the drone. We're gonna, there it is. That's the drone that, in fact, landed on the White House lawn. Now, it doesn't look like much of a lawn behind it, but that is, in fact... <laughs> The drone, which looks very similar to the one Carlos has, so I'm still not convinced. No, no, no. In, in fact, let me bring up my camera so you can see okay, mine. So no, Carlos, see. Uh, <laughs> Carlos is going to uh, whip it out and show us his drone. A little, little, uh, bit, of, little bit of real repu repudiation going on here. That's right. you got to turn your camera on for that, Carlos. We haven't He's been working on it. There it is. Both there of mine are here. There you go. Um, so I see you spray painted DJI something black. Uh, yeah. Nice. Very cool. Not even close. Not I even one that is completely automated by... 
with GPS and everything. Nice. That's the one you fly back and forth to Colombia with 400 grams of. No, on that one I just give it the coordinates, go into mission <laughs> plan, give it, fly from here to here, this altitude, turn here, go here, and it will do everything. For, and just in my remote control, just hit this switch, it will go to auto, and it will do whatever I programmed it to do. Nice. Now, have He's you flying linked, over bikini-clad beaches? Yeah. I guess. Have please. you linked your smart things hub to your drone? That's what I want to know. The integration. Not yet. Is. Yeah, that would be cool. Every time that, I open that, my that, door. In, in fact, since this one is actually running Arduino Pilot, which is based on an Arduino board, I could probably hook up see, something. Did you see the it. gears turning? You could actually see the gears turning there. <laughs> I was like, oh, geez, I had thought about that. I could do something really cool here. <laughs> Absolutely. You're welcome. Yeah, so, so far we think about flying around uh, yeah. all different pools around the area we're here but yes. during summer. Please send us the footage. Um, yeah. So... <laughs> Uh, Joff, you wanted to talk about DDoS. I don't, what did I want to talk about? The Internet of Dangerous Things. <laughs> D, oh DDoS, among, I thought you'd like this, Paul. It's, Kreb, Krebs, I'm enjoying reading Krebs lately. He's, he's mm. got some good mm. stuff. But, uh, I'm going to roll lately. Yeah, the, the uh, Internet of Things, you know, strikes again. But, uh, you know, he's, he's really talking about um, the uptick in, uh, in DDoS uh, for rent, um, largely, as, as an increasing vector uh, of attack. Um, and uh, the fact that they're getting really, really, really large. The, um, the largest reported attack here was 400 gig a second, which, you know, to put that in perspective, if you're a, if you're a really, really, really large, capable business, well, well, let's say you're a university, you're probably connected to the Internet at, at, a, at a gig a second, where if you got 400 gig going at you, you're 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 out of business, and that's not even close to the majority of businesses that are on the net. Mm -hmm. If you've got a st distributed denial of service coming at you, and you're a small to medium business, you you might you might have a hundred meg link. You're completely going down. I mean, there's there's absolutely no way that you can withstand uh, yeah. distributed denial of service at that, uh, at that volume. Now you uh, worked for university, Joff, right? Did you ever did. see a DDoS going out, attacking someone, and you're like, you know, you're the university, you've got a gigabit connection to the internet, and you're like, wow, that poor guy's screwed. I should probably go turn that system off. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I used to be, I used to be an enterprise architect at a, at a large university. We were we were dual one gigabit connected to the um, to the internet, That's and yes, we, we had seen. We had seen incidences where we were dosing others, and we shut them down as quickly as possible, and we're pretty proactive about that. We'd also seen incidents that came back against us uh, f reasonably uh, frequently, and I I've seen them that have pegged out those gigabit links completely to the yep. ceiling. Yeah. Do, do, do um, I see it? It doesn't matter your size. Sooner or later, depending how persistent that attacker is and how much you piss them off, they're going to knock you out of the web. Uh, yeah. it, 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 because if it is not the direct denial of service attack, it's going to be one of your upstreams. It's going to go, dude, I cannot take all of this traffic that is going to you. I'm going to cut you off. And if it, is not, if it is not your direct one, it's going to be one higher up that's, that's going right. to be talking to your provider and saying, hey, dude, you have one of your customers is messing up our traffic. This is going to cost you a lot of money. It's already costing me a lot of money. I need to block everything to your customer. I'm going to start doing this, all, of, all of this other stuff over here to kind of uh, protect my business. And they're going to take you down. It might take a couple of days. It might take a week. As I said, it all depends how persistent the attacker is and how much you piss them off. Yeah, you know, one one of the interesting things is the 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 more sophisticated kind of attack, which which... I have, I have seen, but I think was more accidental than than intent. Was one where the packets are actually set up such that they decrement their TTL to one right before they hit the first router hop on the infrastructure that is being targeted. And what happens to infrastructures where the TTL is one is they tend to get processed on the software backplane of the infrastructure, and so. The infrastructure dies really, really untimely death. I mean, just Ooh. completely, completely so, falls over dead. So the uh, a a ASIC never sees it. The you ASIC never sees the packet. directly to the CPU and right. killing it. It goes right to the control plane. The CPU just dies. Um, 
That's nice. And and I, I expect I, I'd hate to I hate to almost even advertise it, but I, I did now already. I expect we'll <laughs> see some attacks of that nature come about uh, because they are um, they're deadly um, to um, certain vendors. Uh, uh, infrastructure, probably most vendors, because most vendors with a TTL one, they have to process in software. Um, th- th- it's just a, it's not a routable packet at that point. So, um, I want to talk about a presentation that happened at uh, ShmooCon, and this is a particular type of tool that we've talked about in the past that takes uh, screenshots of websites. This one's called HTTP Screenshot. Um, they're recommending this tool for both red and blue teams. It kind of goes back to my point earlier about Mike about self-assessing. Um, one of the the best ways <coughs> to do some vulnerability uh, enumeration is to visit all of the websites, all of the web servers in your environment, and just look at the page that results. And mm. to automate that, take a screenshot of it. There were some yep. early attempts that were really rough. Uh, Tim Tomes wrote, um, was it Peep, Peeping Tom? Peep, Peeping Tom. Peeping yeah. Tom um, that, uh, that did that. And then some folks at ShmooCon, re- and I don't think he's updated that in a long time, um, but these folks uh, made a new tool called HTTP Screenshot, and it parses JavaScript, it does SSL detection, it's threaded, um, it saves the uh, the website in PNG and HTML, so you can grab through the source. So it's got some extra functionality, and I think this is a really awesome approach for gaining a picture, so to speak, of the web services in your environment. Which, as you know, Joff, on a pen test, sometimes very it's like, useful. It's the, like the most effective thing. I mean, you can look at results from all kinds of other scanning tools. You can start trying to go investigate these systems manually, but that takes a really long time, right? So you want to automate this. Uh, and this tool looks pretty promising. I haven't played with it yet, but um, I'm looking forward to hearing about it, Joff, and you run it on your next pen test or something. I am going to look that one up. Uh, that sounds really good. We've used uh, Peeping Tom before because mm-hmm. uh, Tim Tim used to work for us. Um, but um, we do engage in that because I think uh, it's it's a very, very useful way just, just to let's say you've got an external scan of environment and you want to essentially take those screenshots of all the web services in the environment and then just kind of filter through them and look for opportunities um you know having a tool like that is is just really really useful thing to have so awesome i'm gonna check it out cool what else um i talked about black phone found a vulnerability in black phone and i I like the headline um i think this one also came from uh robert graham he said nobody thought black phone was secure just more secure Secure, secure, <laughs> secure, yeah, secure, right? <clears throat> so that was that. There was a Wi-Fi vulnerability on Android, uh, where Core Security found some vulnerabilities there and disclosed some of the details. I haven't read through it in uh, too much detail. It's CVE twenty fourteen oh nine nine seven is an uncaught exception, uh, and there's an article about that, which is kind of interesting. Um, the Apple patched the Thunder Strike bug, which allowed uh, access to OS X systems from the Thunderbolt port, which we talked about on a previous show as well. And I'm glad they patched that one. That was really egregious. Uh, especially so. if you know you're one of those portable systems, like Carlos mentioned, in your in a coffee shop or whatever. Um, that makes the likelihood of attack a lot more uh, feasible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, just the just the nature of that, right? Right at the uh, ROM level, um, just eh, not good. You know, you, you couldn't. <laughs> you're, br- you're breaking systems there. <laughs> yep. Not not pretty. Cool. Anything else, guys? Now, all right. Well, you know what? We'll take a short break. We'll come back and wrap up the show, and do our contest for a free. Hack Naked T-shirt, as we do on every show. So if you tune in live on Thursday nights, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, securityweekly.com slash live, you qualify for the contest, which we're going to read next, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. What do we have for a question? Hey, I was wondering, Paul, are we going to actually ask 
Michael, the five question. I think we did last time he was on the show. Yeah. Did we? Oh, okay. So yeah. he gets a buy this time? Okay. Gets, yeah. Yeah. Um, what are we going to ask for the question? We should really be more prepared for this. Okay. I'm going to ask the question. What is the alternate function name that was suggested by blogger Robert Graham that you should use instead of get host by name? Yeah, that's good. What is the alternate function name instead of get host by name that you should be using? Email your answer to PSW at securityweekly.com. We will pick a ran- Do we pick a random winner? I get confused with our contest. Yes, we pick a random winner from everyone who responds, and we send you a free Hack Naked t-shirt. So PSW at securityweekly.com. What is the alternate, alternate uh, function that Robert Graham suggests you should be using instead of get host by name? Qualified to win a free Hack Naked t-shirt, PSW at securityweekly.com. There is a three-month blackout period, so you can only win a free t-shirt every free three months if you want to participate. Oh, man. I was yeah. going to respond with stir copy, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have the correct answer first, and you can't win more than every three months to give everyone I think a Paul fair just chance. Told me I, was, I think Paul just told me I'm wrong. I can. <laughs> you love stir copy. Um, <laughs> so... Um, yes. Um, let's see. What else do we want to say? That's it. Mike, thank you very much for coming on the show. Hey, man. My pleasure. Great. Oh, and Mike. I love being you, with you guys. You do a, a podcast uh, officially, like a uh, regular podcast. Are you a regular host on the... Down uh, the security rabbit hole, down yeah. Down the security rabbit hole with Raph Alos? Yep. Raph and James Jardine. Hey, yes, James sir. Jardine. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, and I'm, I, I'm toying with getting back into it. I'm actually looking to kick off a leadership series, IT leadership series. Um, sometime in the next couple weeks. Nice. Awesome. It's been a while, man. I mean, I, look, I, I, I honor the, the, the stuff that you guys have built up and the way that you did it. Uh, there were a couple of us that started back right around October 2005. Yeah, and we used to all do a roundtable together, a yep. security roundtable. Those were fun. Yep. We should bring those back, too. I'm putting I, it on you because I'm kind of I'm busy, on board. But I'm going to put yeah. it on you because you started yeah, my, that thing. my free time, I'll, I'll put it together. In your free time, I want you to revive the security roundtable, Mike. <laughs> but we, we should. We should, we we should t- pick we totally some of these should. bigger issues and break them down, both technical and, and look at the app application and the leadership of it That'd be i'm great. in i'm in all right me too awesome thanks everyone for listening thanks to mike thanks to joff and carlos for participating in this episode we wish larry the best as he nurses his well balls balls so to can speak. i take us out paul can yes, i take us out joff please take us out over and 404 page not found <laughs> Thank you.